Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, Islam. So on your notes, that'll be, I think, page 133. In the notes here, I summarize, give a basic summary of Islam. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll try to focus in on the world view, uh, some tips for uh, Christian confrontation with Islam, and then I'd like to look at uh, the couple of articles that I passed out for you. So, uh, obviously there's a lot of interest today from Christians uh, in regard to Islam uh, because of its growing popularity in the world and in the United States and because of all the attention that's been given uh, lately uh, since uh, 9-11 and all the things going on. Uh, Christians are uh, wondering about how do we approach uh, this particular uh, issue. You know, how do we share with people who we know are uh, members of Islam? So let's go ahead and look at some basic things about it. Uh, Islam, as we mentioned, uh, is a religion that affirms the following. Uh, there is only one God, Allah, and that Muhammad is the last and greatest prophet. So Islam is going to be fairly simple to understand uh, in the sense that if you affirm that there's one God, Allah, and that Muhammad is his prophet, you know, and you believe that, uh, that's really the main criteria that it takes to be, uh, be a Muslim. Uh, in Arabic, Islam means surrender or submission and refers to submission to the will of God. Thus, a follower of Islam is called a Muslim or one who surrenders to God. Uh, when I wrote these notes, I had one billion followers in the world. Uh, it's even a uh, uh, little more than that today. As far as the origin of Islam, uh, around AD 570, Muhammad, uh, the founding prophet of Islam, was born in Mecca of Arabia. Little is known about his early life. He was born into one of the lesser clans. At the time, the Arabs were divided into many tribal confederacies and followed a religious belief in which there were many gods and spirits, polytheism. Uh, some say strange and miraculous signs happened at the time of Muhammad's birth. At about age 40, he began to experience religious trances. About the year 610, the angel Gabriel uh, allegedly appeared to him uh, and delivered a message from Allah. You know, and they would see a connection between that angel Gabriel and what we see in the, uh, in the Bible. So uh, Muhammad supposedly received his messages for over 20 years. Uh, he began preaching a new religion, which is Islam. Uh, in the day that he was living, there was a lot of uh, polytheism. As a matter of fact, that was the major belief. And so he comes in with a strong monotheism and taught that all idols of the Arabs should be destroyed, uh, that there was one God who is Allah. Uh, his teachings at first were severely opposed. In 622, he had to leave Mecca, but Mecca did submit to Muhammad two years before his death. The year 630 ended up being a year of triumph for Islam. Polytheism was defeated in the Arab cities, the traditional polytheistic beliefs of the Arab peoples. Uh, were known as the Jahiliyyah, which means ignorance, and Mecca became the center of monotheism. Of course, people within Islam view uh, Muhammad uh, as uh, the prophet. He's viewed as the culmination of all the prophets before him. So he's the last prophet. He's also the culmination of the prophets that came before. So they would recognize several of the prophets of the Bible, but would see him as the culmination. Uh, Moses, John, the Baptist, and Jesus uh, are also viewed as prophets, but their messages were distorted by the Jews and Christians, and Muhammad supposedly calibrates uh, these uh, distortions. Uh, when you get into the Quran, the Quran means reading or recitation. The Quran is the sacred scripture of Islam. Uh, supposedly, there were messages given to him over a period of 20 years. As far as the process goes, you allegedly have the eternal heavenly Quran. Uh, then you have Gabriel's oral revelation to Muhammad, which takes place over a series of years. Uh, and then you have Muhammad's oral revelation to his followers, and then from the followers to the written Quran. Um, you know, last time we talked a little bit about the textual issues. Uh, there ends up being, I don't know if I have time to read this whole section here that I brought, but for those of you who are interested, maybe uh, at the end of class or whatever, you could take a look at this. There's... Uh, some of you are asking about the whole issue of uh, uh, textual issues in regard to the uh, final commissioning of the Quran. Uh, from what I understand, again, if this is the sort of thing you could do, not now, but maybe sometime later, 
There's uh, quite a bit, I think, on the internet as far as just Googling stuff about the Quran and textual transmission. So you can, if you wanted to get into the details of the process. So supposedly there's this heavenly Quran, which exists perfectly in heaven. And then you have these revelations given to uh, Muhammad. And then he passes those on orally to his followers. Uh, according to this book that I have here, the Anthology of World Scriptures, which is like a college-level textbook by Van Verst, uh, he states the next stage in the development of the Quran was its oral transmission and prophetic utterances to Muhammad's followers. Muhammad spoke to them the words that Gabriel supposedly commanded him to speak, which are often introduced in the Quran by the imperative say. Muhammad's disciples committed his sayings to memory and spoke them to others, and these early, quote, reciters of the Quran played an important part in its survival and transmission. So there, in a sense, is this, you know, the oral transmission concept. So supposedly they memorized exactly what Muhammad had told them. Uh, but as the Hadith narrates, Muhammad's followers also wrote them down at his command on pieces of paper, stones, palm leaves, shoulder blade bones and ribs, and bits of leather. In other words, on any material at hand. The Quran in its final form bears witness to some difficulties in composition. Substitution of verses, <coughs> new revelations that cancel out older ones, and long periods <coughs> between revelations. A hadith even speaks of, quote, satanic verses, in which Muhammad initially was led by Satan to give a revelation that favored some form of polytheism. He later rejected them in favor of strict monotheism, that is the essential element of Islam. After Muhammad's death in 632, and the Battle of Yamama in 633, it was feared that knowledge of the Quran, still mostly recited orally, might die out. Uh, the process of recording all of it in writing began under the first caliph, Umar, but different versions arose with consequent disputes over which Quran was better. So there ends up being disputes in that regard. To end these troubles, uh, Caliph Uthman, who died in 656, commissioned, respected, and learned men to produce a single recognized version using the best manuscripts and the memories of those with recognized knowledge of the Quran. This version became the only authorized text recognized by the Muslim community, believed to be a true copy of the, quote, mother of the book. Other texts were systematically collected and destroyed. Today, almost all Muslims view the Uthmanic edition as identical to the Quran of Muhammad. No attempt to go behind this authorized version has been made, as it would be considered blasphemy to suggest that this is not the exact Quran that God gave originally to Muhammad. So, and it goes on from there. And like I said, there's more detail that you can get into. So, are there textual issues with the Quran? I mean, the answer is yes. Um, like I said, I think that's something you could, uh, if you're more interested in that, that's something you could be able to chase down, I think, pretty easily. So there are issues there. Yep. Did Muhammad have any influence from, like, have you read parts of scripture or in, in, mm -hmm. in interaction with Christians? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so he would have, yeah, he would have had, yeah, he did have interactions with both, and he would have been familiar with the, uh, with Judaism and Christianity. The uh, page, page 135, the Quran is about the length of the New Testament, is divided into 114 chapters called surahs. After the Quran, the second authority in Islam is the Hadith, uh, which are traditions about Muhammad. Islam is basically about keeping the five pillars. So if you're going to be a, you know, a good Muslim, these are the things that you will do. The first and the most important is the profession of faith, or the Shahada, which is the statement that I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is his prophet. This public and sincere profession is required for membership in the Muslim community. Anyone can become a Muslim by this confession, regardless of race, sex, or social status. The second one would be prayer. There's five prescribed daily prayers that must be performed. <clears throat> going on to the next page, I'm going to summarize a little of this. There's almsgiving, there's fasting. Uh, there's a pilgrimage, which able-bodied Muslims are supposed to make a pilgrim, pilgrimage to Mecca at least once. Okay, let's talk about the worldview of Islam. 
uh, Islam <clears throat> views itself as generally being in line with the religions of Judaism and Christianity. So they'll uh, sometimes refer to Jews and Christians as people of the book. Islam recognizes prophets from both Judaism and Christianity, but sees the true message of these religions as being corrupted by their followers. So that was pointed out by Bonson and by others that, that there appears to be kind of a, a, a sticky point for Islam in that regard is they, they tell you to go back to you know, the, the old te- what we would consider to be the Old Testament and to view that as uh, affirming Islam, but they also tell you at the same time that it's been corrupted. So you're supposed to both trust it and not trust it uh, at the same time. Of course, their view of the absolute is strong monotheism, only Allah is God. Uh, Surah 59.23 says, He is Allah, then whom there is no other God, the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One, Peace, the Keeper of Faith, the Guardian, the Majestic, the Compeller, the Superb. Uh, Allah is supposedly a transcendent being, has created everything, will judge everyone, is all-powerful, sovereign, and unknowable. Uh, Angels exist as his messengers. As far as the world goes, Islam assumes the basic elements of the biblical story or origins. Uh, for them, God created the world. Uh, there was a, a literal Adam and Eve. However, diverging from the biblical account, Adam quickly repents, and thus there are no negative implications for the human condition or creation. Also, Adam became the first of God's prophets. There's two realms of existence, the seen and the unseen. <coughs> Uh, God is sovereign over all. As far as humans go, uh, all humans are created by Allah. Adam and Eve were the first humans. Humans have a moral responsibility before God. Uh, I don't think within Islam you have quite the concept of total depravity that I think you see within Christianity. As far as problem for humans, <clears throat> page 139, humans are mostly ignorant of God's will. Uh, there's also sin. God's clear message through the prophets has been corrupted. The Bible of the Jews and Christians has been tainted. The solution for humans is salvation comes acknowledging that there's no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his prophet, and then you keep the five pillars. One of the things that Christians will often point out in this regard is the fact that there's really no solution for the sin problem you know, within Islam. I mean, God's, you know, Allah is supposedly this holy being, yet when it comes to sin, there's really no uh, remedy. Uh, and so thus there's basically acknowledgement that of the one God in the keeping of the five pillars, there's also really no security within Islam as well because unless you're a martyr, it doesn't matter how good you may live your life, you still may end up on the wrong end of eternity. Uh, so the ethics, <clears throat> you know, keeping the five pillars really strong against uh, alcohol and gambling. So when Muhammad came on the scene, there was a lot of gam- you know, gambling and alcohol with the polytheistic system in the area. That gets removed. As far as community, um, I'll move on to the next page. All Muslims belong to the Ummah, to the one community. Then there's various ritual symbols. Um, you know, I'm going to skip over some of that stuff. Uh, come over to page 142. As far as life after death, Muslims believe you know, in life after death. Each person will be resurrected, appear before God, and judged according to his or her deeds. Uh, God will send some to reward in paradise and some to punishment in hell. Uh, They hold to a linear view of history. As far as Islam and other religions, they do believe that everyone should convert to Islam. Christians and Jews are tolerated more than others because they are people of the book, but they should convert. Initially, Muhammad was sympathetic to Jews, Christians, and those who were monotheists. However, Muhammad became more negative about Jews and Christians when they would not convert and even show disdain for Islam. Some Jews were exiled or slaughtered. In theory, Islam generally allows Jews and Christians to practice their religions under Muslim governments. Jews and Christians are considered the dima upon payment of a tax. Jews and Christians, though, are not allowed to try to convert uh, Muslims to their faith system. Uh, Point number five, there is no uh, tolerance for atheists, polytheists, or people who apostatize from Islam. Uh, Of course, then you get into the concept of jihad, seems to me that in the basic uh, understanding of jihad in the Muslim countries is that it does have a violent uh, element to it. It does seem to me more Western Muslims sometimes emphasize the just the internal personal struggle. Uh, if you ever want to get more specifically into that, the book put out by 
Emer and Ergen Kanner uh, on uh, Islam, unveiling Islam or something like that, uh, which is written by one of the guys who's at, uh, actually I, he was a professor and I was at Southeastern Seminary, I can't remember if he's at Southwestern now or whatever, but that it was a uh, award-winning book from a Christian perspective dealing with the whole issue of Islam. They get really specific on uh, that jihad is not just internal personal struggle, but involves um, you know more of a violent aspect to it. Can you say the author of the book again? Uh, Caner, C-A-N-E-R. The brothers, uh, they're both their last name is C-A-N-E-R. And somebody does have permission to pull that up on Amazon if they want to get the exact title. I can't remember if it's called Islam or Unveiling Islam. Unveiling Islam, Unveiling Islam. okay. Uh, it's one of those, like I said, it was, it was the book of the year, you know, three or four years ago. Uh, the Can what's interesting about the Cantor brothers is that they grew up, you know, in a Muslim family. Their dad disowned them. I mean, so this is a real authentic, uh, it's an evangelical presentation of Islam, but it's coming from people who really, you know, who were in that system. So um, in the uh, major religions class, I have the guys read that book. So, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, we could just, there's a lot of stuff that we could, I mean, for our purposes here, I want to get more into the whole issue of apologetics, um, but clearly there's more that could be done. But if you're interested in discussing and looking at it more, I, I recommend the Canner book. So, uh, all right, so now what that brings us to is the whole issue of dealing with Islam. So, I think at this point, let's look at, let's look at the articles that I passed out. And if you came in super late, you can come up here and grab one if you want. So I got a couple up here. Uh, since we're talking about apologetics in this class, and in particular presuppositional apologetics, I thought it'd be good to look at a couple direct treatments of dealing with Islam. This first one article, now I copied them together. There's a one that I pulled off the internet. Actually, both of them are pulled off the internet. Uh, the second article is actually by Bonson, but putting this in our context, you know, we're talking about presuppositional apologetics, and I think many of you would agree that as we listen to the Bonson-Stein debate and we've looked at the books that we've had, that there appears to be a pretty good response to atheism from presuppositionalism. As a matter of fact, I think most people who study apologetics and presuppositionalism would say that uh, presuppositionalism has done a very nice job in dealing with atheism. Uh, because there's some similarity with the Eastern religions to atheism in regard to the fact that there's an impersonal absolute, a lot of the arguments you would make against atheism would be pretty similar within an Eastern religion context, which is basically how do you get any kind of ethics or standards or anything from an impersonal. Uh, one of the things that's been more difficult, though, is the, the appearance of an Achilles heel or a weak point for presuppositionalism is in regard to how it deals with Islam. Uh, because, you know, as you see, the transcendental argument used against atheist and Eastern religions, you see, you know, very, uh, there's some very stark contrast. I mean, you're dealing with the whole issue is, is there a God versus is there not a God? When you get into Islam, you see some similarities with Christianity in regard to monotheism, sovereign God, transcendent. And so uh, the general assumption is that, you know, presuppositionalism is weaker when it comes to dealing with Islam. So I found two articles that I want to mention here that try to deal with that particular issue. So, you know, we can talk about that, whether we feel that these are effective uh, treatments or not. So. Uh, let's go ahead and look at this. Um, uh, it should be no secret uh, that those who have read this blog for a while, that John and I uh, favor uh, apologetics of the presuppositional Van Til tradition. So these guys who are writing this definitely are in the Van Tilian tradition. I'm not interested in trying to prove presuppositional apologetics to its opponents here on the blog. There are plenty of resources that have endeavored to do so and much more thoroughly than I could. The times I post on it will be an, the times I post on it will be an attempt to further develop presuppositional apologetics, or to fill in some of the gaps that I find in the resources. As I have as I have talked with various people about presuppositional apologetics, I noticed 
that the question feared above by all presuppositionalists, they avoid it like the plague, is the question of whether and how presuppositionalism can be effective against non-Christian faiths. Those who are antagonistic relish in faulting presuppositionalism as incapable of arguing transcendentally for the Christian God against other varieties of theism. In order to do so, they must break down and yield to using evidence based on common ground, or so the criticism goes. There has been some response from presuppositionalists to this criticism and counter-response from presuppositionalist critics. The response, for the most part, is good as far as it goes, but I think that presuppositionalism is capable of a more formidable defense. There are at least three problems with the way presuppositionalists have used its apologetic vis-a-vis -vis world religions. I'll focus on Islam primarily as a test case for presuppositional encounters with other religions. So what he does here is he summarizes what he believes are three problems with the way presuppositionalists have used apologetics in regard to world religions. Number one, he states, presuppositionalists have not educated themselves on world religions to the degree that they have on atheism. Consequently, they are better at confronting atheism with the transcendental argument and have insufficiently applied its apologetic to world religions. And I think that's a fair observation there. And again, part of that may be, too, uh, the, the timing of things as well. I mean, if you look at uh, particularly like what Bonson is doing in the 80s and stuff, I mean, there, you know, there's a sense in which you might even say that the, the threat of atheism at that particular time may have appeared to, to loom larger uh, than... Uh, you know, that perhaps of uh, Islam at that particular point. Uh, so I would say in general that, I would say in general that's true. And I would even say, and look at the books that we've read. Now again, some of them are dated back to the 80s and the 90s too, so we want to be fair. But, you know, as, as we read our books on presuppositionalism, it was very heavily tilted in regard to dealing with atheism. I mean, I think that's a fair observation. Uh, he states, consider that Cornelius Van Til's works are virtually silent on world religions. Now, point number two, he states that presuppositionalists such as Greg Bonson, John Frame, and Scott Oliphant have treated world religions as primarily an ad hoc matter. They have been largely silent on the matter of world religions, though more vocal than Van Til, and have addressed them primarily for the purpose of silencing the critic's objection rather than proactively addressing religions in order to develop a full-orbed apologetic. So... In other words, he doesn't believe that they're, you know, they, they haven't devoted as much time. Now, to be fair to Bonson, he has debated, you know, uh, a Muslim before, and he's done some writing on that. I mean, clearly, though, his main emphasis has been on dealing with atheism. Uh, number three, presuppositionalists have misunderstood the facts and doctrines of several world religions. Consequently, they have passed on this faulty information. So, and I even think here that he might even see Bonson perhaps is uh, not maybe perhaps taking uh, Islam or understanding it as correctly or perhaps even making arguments against Islam that perhaps could be thrown back in the face of a Christian. So I'm not saying he's right. I'm just saying that's one of his observations. Uh, he quotes Bonson here. Greg Bonson speaking of other faiths states, metaphysically there is no God or no personal God who is omniscient and sovereign uh, etc. These sacred books are not and cannot be anything like what the Bible claims for itself, namely to be the personal communication and infallible verbal revelation from the only living, completely sovereign and all-knowing creator. So that's the quote from Bonson. Now this individual comes back and says, but is there any Muslim worth his weight in prayer mats who wouldn't claim the same for Allah and the Quran? Personal? Check. Omniscient? Check. Sovereign? Check. Inf infallible verbal revelation check. Of course, I'm not saying that Muslim doctrine is true, only that when seeking to show the uniqueness of Christian doctrine, it can't be found on these points. Though I think one could argue that how Scripture speaks of God's sovereignty is different than how the Quran speaks of Allah's sovereignty. So in other words, he's not, he personally wasn't impressed, uh, particularly when Bonson went to the whole issue of trying to say, you know, uh, certain things about Allah from the Quran. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think he would say that some of those things could be used against Christianity. So putting together a method for confronting world religions. 
Uh, he states, no one has criticized presuppositionalism's ability to confront other religions using a transcendental method more than John Johnson. Uh, John Frame and Steve Hayes jointly responded to Johnson's article, whereupon Johnson countered their response. While Frame and Hayes have adequately answered Johnson's critique, they have not done much by way of positively developing a transcendental method for defending the Christian faith over against the non-Christian faiths. So, again, when we're talking about the transcendental, you know, showing the impossibility of the contrary. I mean, uh, you know, Bonson attempted, seemed to me to be pretty good at it, the issue of showing the impossibility of atheism. Um, but the cr criticism here is have the presuppositionalists been able to show the impossibility of the non-Christian faiths like Islam. The claim of the transcendental argument in its bare bones form is that unless the Trinitarian Christian God exists, knowledge isn't possible. Knowledge isn't possible in any other worldview scheme. Of course, this doesn't mean that people who hold to non-Christian worldviews do not possess knowledge, only that when they do, their knowledge comes from the Christian worldview and not their own. Thus, they are being inconsistent with their worldview. Largely, it has seemed easier for presuppositionalists to confront atheism rather than other theistic religions with this claim. So how does one show that, Islam, that if Islam is true, knowledge isn't possible? So I think this really gets to the crux of it here. I mean, he, in other words, I think what you could say up until this point is that presupposition, you know, as a presuppositionalist and as a Vantillian, this individual doesn't feel that there's been uh, enough done in the way of the world religions or Islam. There has been enough done on atheism. So how do you argue transcendentally? How would you argue the impossibility uh, of Islam from a presuppositional standpoint? <clears throat> so he gives some points here. Uh, one, he points out that the most common presuppositional method is to point out internal contradictions in Islam and then conclude that knowledge isn't possible on the basis of a worldview that contradicts itself. So one way to go is internal contradictions within Islam. He says, I think this can be an effective route, though it doesn't necessarily vindicate Christian doctrine. We have to also show how knowledge is possible on the basis of the Christian worldview. One of the dangers with this method, though, is that we will do, listen to this, one of the dangers with this method, though, is that we will do what we would never tolerate to be done to us, ripping verses from the Quran, disregarding both textual and historical context, and finding contradiction on this basis. Unfortunately, this has been done by some presuppositionalists, and he's critical of Bonson on this point. Greg Bonson, for example, argues that Allah is too transcendent to be able to reveal himself to humanity. He cites Surah 42.11 in support of this doctrine. The verse simply says, Nothing can be compared with him, Allah. He alone hears all and sees all. So Bonson did use that to say that that verse ends up being, an, you know, it, it can be used against Islam. Now, if we're honest... I think we have to admit that there is nothing in this verse that demonstrates any difference in the transcendence of Yahweh versus the transcendence of Allah. Perhaps a Muslim could cite Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 to say the same criticism could apply equally to Yahweh. Of course, the Christian would object that Isaiah 55 has to be put in the context of the whole Bible. He could start by going to other texts or even Isaiah 55 to show that Yahweh is near and may be found and then talking about the necessity that God be a trinity in order to reveal himself in Jesus Christ. It's illegitimate to try to characterize Christianity with one verse, and the same applies for Islam. Presuppositionalists need to argue for the inconsistency of Allah's character across the Quran, and not just with one verse, and I think this can be done. This task, while more difficult, will be more accurate and more convincing. So the point here is that he does think that you can use the Quran to show internal inconsistencies, but he believed that, like Bonson, by throwing out one verse, and you know that that that's not sufficient. There has to be more. And he would say that you know, uh, you know that you know perhaps the same argument could be made against Christianity. One verse could be taken, and then we would say no. But if you understand it in its context, you know that's not what it's saying. So. Now, at this point, he doesn't get more specific on that. I mean, he, I mean, it'd be helpful at this point where he'd say, now here's, a, here's eight 
Here's eight other examples that show a contradiction. So it's more of a principle than showing how that fleshes out. Uh, number two, another approach that presuppositionalists take is to argue that the other major theistic religions are spin-offs and perversions of Christianity. <clears throat> oh, one second, Richard, I'll get to you. So in other words, so, and I, I would say that this is true. So I think when you study presupposition, whenever you do find them addressing the issue of Islam, you do see two different approaches. One would be uh, the internal contradictions part where you go to the Quran and say, you know, it's, uh, it says something here which is inconsistent with what's being said over here. And then the other approach that he's talking about here is just to say, you know, in a sense, treat it as a perversion of Christianity, uh, which he's going to talk about. Richard. Yeah. The only thing, it doesn't seem like he's being fair with that statement you just made, because I think people who make that argument would obviously acknowledge Judaism as the basis for Christianity. Okay, so they wouldn't be fair with what particular? I just don't think anybody who thinks that world religions are a spinoff of Christianity ignores the obvious fact that if you're a Christian, you know that Christianity is built upon Judaism. Okay. Think, and he says in his argument here that it's hard to make the case that Judaism is a spinoff of Christianity. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is I don't think that's what people who argue that are arguing. Or arguing? Yes, you feel like he's missing. I'm ignoring the, you know, the historical basis for Christianity is Judaism. Okay. Okay. Good, that's a good observation. Yeah, so let's look at that here. Um, so the second one be, is another approach that presuppositions take is to argue that other major theistic religions are spin-offs. John Frame and Steve Hayes offered this argument in their response to John Johnson. There are several problems with this approach, not the least of which is that it's hard to make the case that, that Judaism is spin-off of Christianity. And I think you're right on that. I don't think anybody's really claiming that. I mean, usually you, there's a claim that Islam is that it's borrowing a lot from Christianity and Judaism. Uh, I'm not generally convinced that this is a very effective method in apologetics. Arguing for a particular genealogy of faith seems to be a distraction from the real work at hand, namely to show that knowledge can't happen in accord with a non-Christian religion. Showing that Islam has derived itself from Christianity no more proves that Islam is a perversion of Christianity than it does that Islam is an improvement on Christianity. Descending from another religion does not prove its inferiority. Furthermore, if it did not prove inferiority, it wouldn't prove that presuppositionalists are going for, namely, that knowledge is not possible if Islam is true. I'm almost surprised that he didn't perhaps make the argument that, you know, uh, you wouldn't say that Christianity is false because it's a spinoff of Judaism. I'm not saying that's the right way to look at it, but in other words, so, so in other words, some are... Again, I'm not getting into whether that's, it's a good argument or not, but, he, but some would claim that since Islam spins off, uh, has similarities to Christianity, it must be a perversion of Christianity. I'm surprised he didn't make the argument that perhaps you could say the same about Christianity coming off of Judaism. Uh, and of course, just because something springs out of something else doesn't necessarily make it wrong. Uh, he does say the most it would show is that there are more or better knowledge possible if the Christian worldview is correct than if Islam is correct. I think it is best if this tact tactic is dropped altogether. So that's maybe one thing we can talk about when we're done with this article too. Is he, he is claiming that to try to claim that Islam is merely a perversion of Christianity should be dropped as a tactic. <clears throat> Number three... Christianity has the benefit of a redemptive history that Islam does not have. Emphasizing this is the positive presentation of Christianity that argues for Christianity and not just against Islam. Confronting world religions must go beyond simply pointing out contradictions in their scriptures and doctrines. That's a pretty loaded statement there. Let me read it again. Christianity has the benefit of a redemptive history that Islam does not have, emphasizing that that this is the positive presentation of Christianity that argues for Christianity and not just against Islam. Confronting world religions must go beyond simply pointing out contradictions in their scriptures and doctrines. It seems to me at that little point there might be a little bit of a divergence from Van Til in that regard. Because the main thing with the transcendental argument is your, is your uh, Christianity is true because of the impossibility of the contrary. So it's... Van Til wasn't so much, although he certainly believed the evidence points to Christianity, Van Til was more interested in showing the impossibility, because if every other worldview is impossible, then Christianity must be true. So I, that kind of caught my eye a little bit. Now, it is often said 
that the Bible is one big story. It is the progress of redemption. The same cannot be said of the Quran. It is largely prescriptive, not descriptive. As both a descriptive and prescriptive book, the Bible portrays God as bringing the history of the world to a final point. He has a purpose and goal to which he is moving all things. Though we don't know the timeline, we do know the end. Christianity is both history and eschatology. Islam largely lacks this quality of history and eschatology. So that's an interesting statement there. Uh, he believes that Islam lacks uh, history and eschatology. There is much said about an afterlife for faithful Muslims and the afterlife for infidels, but little is said about the redemption of humanity and the redemption of the earth, or what we might call the restoration of all things. So there may be discussion of you know, where people go, but it does seem like the Bible presents more of a, of a holistic uh, uh, restoration of the planet and the people that would be involved and everything else. For the sake of brevity, I can only highlight this point, but the difference in history and eschatology here has an enormous effect on the ethical differences between the triune God and Allah. Allah plans to show mercy to the obedient and punish the infidel. God, on the other hand, from the wicked people of the world, redeems a people he has chosen, not because they were obedient, but for his own glory. But in redeeming them, they are no longer wicked. He makes them obedient through regeneration. To do this, the Father sends his Son to take wickedness of the people on himself. Thus, the Christian God enters into the suffering with his people as the Son receives the guilt of sin and as the Father exacts his wrath for sin on his beloved Son. In short, God does for his people what they could not do for themselves, and yet in doing so, he does not compromise his holiness. Allah, as a monistic God, cannot do what the Christian God can do. He can only reward obedience and punish wickedness, but he cannot redeem and regenerate. This creates an ethical dilemma for Allah. According to Islam, Allah is holy and each person disobedient. But through the following, the five pillars, one can hope that Allah will show mercy, but nothing is done with the disobedience. Allah must simply ignore it if one is to hope to enter into heaven. But this cannot be done without Allah compromising his holiness. So I think really what he's saying there is he's telling the Muslim, you have no solution for sin. In Islam, sin is not dealt with. It is punished in some and overlooked in others. In the Bible, however, we read of the progress of the triune God dealing with sin by conquering it and eliminating it, not simply punishing it and ignoring it. To return to the matter of the possibility of knowledge in Islam, I don't see how it can overcome the problem of the effect of sin on our minds. In Christianity, the believer's mind is being renewed through regeneration. Ironically, I rarely hear presuppositionalists contrasting regeneration in Christianity with the lack thereof in Islam. So he thinks regeneration should be emphasized more. Finally, I want to give a bit of advice. When approaching other religions from a presuppositional framework, focus primarily on biblical theology. The story of creation, the fall, and redemption that a religion tells is the best way to contrast Christianity with it and to demonstrate the inconsistencies and moral compromise of the religion. We must look at the character of a religion's God or gods through its doctrine and not just proof texting from a few samples of their writings. If they cannot offer a coherent and purposeful history of redemption, then they cannot account for knowledge at all in terms of their worldview because the fear of Yahweh uh, is the beginning uh, of knowledge. Okay, what do you think of that? Uh, there's some interest, I mean, whether you agree with all his points, none of it or all of it or whatever, I mean, there's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty concise uh, uh, dealing with the issues. Yeah, Tim. I forget where we read this, but I remember hearing how people won't come to a faith through argumentation. They're going to come by wanting what you're presenting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true in Islam because they live in, in fear, not knowing whether their sin is going to be accounted for or not. Right, great fear. That if you can show how much hope there is in Christianity, and yeah, this redemption story, mm -hmm then, I mean, Islam pales 
in comparison to, to how amazing that is in right. Christianity. Right. And yeah, people who convert and come to Christianity out of an Islamic background hold on to that very strongly and really just get blown away by the reality of grace and a God. Who right. Is, I think that's very see. true. And I and I again I mean I mentioned that before when we we're talking about people who have converted from Hinduism and uh, Buddhism, but you also find that too with people who have converted from Islam. Again, the concepts of the grace, yeah. eternal security yeah. is a very has been a very attractive thing. So it does appear that there it appears to me that as a as a presuppositionalist there if you take his suggestion, you, you in a sense could say that there's three ways to try to deal with Islam. One, you could try to show internal inconsistency supposedly that exists from what the Quran says and supposedly inconsistencies within the Quran itself or statements within the Quran that contradict known beliefs about Islam. So you could try to go that route, which appears to be, I don't know if all of these are mutually exclusive. I don't think they necessarily are. But that could be a main tack to try to show internal inconsistencies in a sense by using the Quran against the Muslim. Now again, that would take a lot of knowledge. And his observation, whether he's correct or not, is that Bonson really didn't even do a good job trying to do that because he felt that he was being kind of, I don't think he used the word glib, but if you, you can't just defeat a religion by quoting one verse. So, and I, I think he's sensitive again to the idea that if you just pick out one verse, the Muslim is going to say, well, that's out of context. You don't understand that. And then the same thing could be done to the Christian. So that, perhaps that's an interesting uh, topic in and of itself that we could talk about. And then the, the second approach would be is to say, don't accept Islam because it's a perversion of Christianity. And, you know, again, perhaps a case could be made for that. He didn't like that idea. And then the third approach, which appears to me, he doesn't really define, the, uh, give it a title or whatever, but it appears to be, a positive presentation of the worldview of Christianity. Uh, in other words, uh, showing the, the big Christian story and dealing, you know, and, and giving rich, deep answers concerning the problem of sin, God's solution for sin, redemption, uh, emphasizing eschatology, which deals with the restoration of all things. And in doing so, there's a pretty clear contrast with Islam. So it appears to be three at that point. Any thoughts on that? What do you, let, let's, let's talk about that. What do you, uh, you know, you, and, and again, I'm not saying you have to agree with all this or whatever. Maybe they're, maybe you think he's being unfair to Bonson, but what do you think about those three? Yep. On the second point, I think, yeah, he, he's right, but when you, when you read Quran after you read Old Testament, mm -hmm. you suddenly get that feeling that it's bits and pieces puts in and, and takes out of context. Yeah. That's an interesting, you mean with the perversion aspect? Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, because, I mean, perhaps you could make the argument that here you have these factual statements given in the Old Testament, and now you're saying, or and the New Testament, so now you're saying Jesus didn't really die, although there's all this evidence that it did, and, you know, all these statements that, that there appears to be no reason to reject the biblical account, but here they're doing something with else. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a valid point to bring up. Yeah, let's go to Daniel, and we'll come back to Mass. You say sometimes... I don't know, as we go through this with yeah. the Muslim, I think we almost overly focus on how their faults versus there is some commonalities, just taking them and they say Christ is a, you know, he's one of the prophets. There's a lot in common in just taking them to scripture. Instead of trying to focus on showing them, okay, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Pick them up where they're right and then go from there? Pick them up where they're okay. right and take them to truth instead of just saying, you're wrong, you need to listen to me. You say, yeah. you believe Christ is a prophet, let's look at it. Let's look at Christ as, you know, as yeah. his prophet. What I think there is say? something, to, I mean, there is something to the fact of picking up where they're at. I think Bonson even emphasized that in the early part. I think it would have to be both. I think it would have to be, I, I do think you'd pick it, I mean, you don't have to go back and recreate the wheel on the creation and the transcendence issue, so I agree with that. But clearly you'd have to go, since Christ is so pivotal for salvation, you'd have to say, yeah, he is a prophet, but he's also a priest, king, <laughs> God, all those sorts of things. So, yeah. Yep. I like what he's saying, what he's saying in this article here. To me, what I hear him saying is share the gospel with them, because mm -hmm. that's creation, fall, redemption, yeah. restoration. But I, I think, I like, like what Dan, just pick up on what Dan just said, that to, to leverage what they say, to bring them back to the scriptures. Christ okay. is a prophet, Moses is a prophet. 
and let them, uh, and this isn't like a one day process, because mm -hmm. my interaction with Muslims is they've been, a lot of them have been influenced by Muslim apologists. So they have, and, and these Muslim apologists rail on Christians. Uh, they've, I've seen all these YouTube videos, sure, and they just, they're very um, aggressive, and uh, you have to let them see this, <coughs> un unfold the scriptures to them, and then help press them to draw co the conclusions that, okay, you're saying the Bible has errors, there's no errors in it, it's saying this about Jesus, but that's mm -hmm. not really, you say that the, the Bible says this about Jesus, but it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. So that they have to draw the conclusion, is the Bible right, or is the Quran right? You okay. So they need to see the contrast. Yeah. And, so, and you can do that by unfolding biblical yeah. theology for them. Yeah. But you have to press them. So would you see perhaps a, a combination of one and three? I mean, would that, would that what you're I talking about so. come I, under internal? I, I think so, one and three. But when I say internal contradictions, I would see more the contradiction contrast. between the contrast okay. between Christianity and, uh, and the Quran. Okay. So, so perhaps really hammer home the issue. Maybe like Bonson did a little bit by... Showing, you know, you 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 do say that you accept this, but then you're what the, some of the things that you're coming to clearly are contrast and go against it, and making that a big focal point. Okay, good. Yeah, John. I sort of follow up on that. I think, you know, as I was thinking about points one and three, mm -hmm. um, and and the fact that presuppositionalism does endeavor to establish Christianity by showing the impossibility of the contrary. But I looked back over the. the the transcript of, of the Stein debate here, just mm -hmm. for like 30 seconds, just okay. with his opening and closing statements and a couple things. And he really does say very little with a, with a proclamation or a claim of Christian truth. And, and, you know, as far as redemptive... As far as a positive not, presentation. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's very consistent with the Van Tillian. Yeah. And, but, but the, and, and uh, you know, I, I think... I, I see his point now because I see how often, you know, Bonson is saying impossibility of the contrary, impossibility right. of the contrary, but all he deals with is the contrary. Yeah. And and so and so you're left sort of like, you know, I know I'm hungry, but but, but, what, but what can I eat? You know, sort yeah. of, you know. And or the example I uh, it could be is the uh, the reason why I love my wife is because the impossibility of me of lo me loving other women. <laughs> if you use that with your wife, that wouldn't go over very well. I love you because I couldn't love anybody else. <laughs> so, but that I think that's a very you know that's a that's what come to me. I, I do personally, I find Bonson to be sharper and more helpful than Frame. Uh, on a lot of stuff, but but that was one thing I frame brought up that I thought was good in this book was does it have to be just all a negative critique? I mean, in our sense, can't we can't there be the positive presentation of you know? And, and again, Bonson wouldn't. I mean, he, clearly he's bringing his in the gospel too, but um, I do think that there's something there to the positive. Andrew, and then we'll go back to Richard. Um, the idea with the possibility of the contrary. Mm -hmm. um, in that process, that doesn't include interventionally an idea of this positive presentation because I feel like they're sort of one and the same. Yeah. Because if you're showing something to be impossible, it has to be shown, I think, through a contrast of, you know, they what's have to true say, yeah, what in order to true, contrast, yeah. What is wrong, you know, and I feel like yeah. they just focus on the contradictions within Quran. Yeah. They're not going to see it unless they see what is the other option of the Yeah, option. I don't know why it has to be. I mean, even as you're do, showing the impossibility of the contrary, you could start out with the positive declaration of what's true and then go to that. It, it, the way that it's practically worked out with Van Til and Bonson, it definitely has been more on the emphasizing the negatives of the other, but I don't know, I don't know why it couldn't be that. And I would just say practically as I deal with people of other worldviews or whatever, I find myself doing, do, trying to incorporate both. Richard? The last statement in the last paragraph, mm -hmm. they cannot offer a coherent and purposeful history of redemption, and they cannot account for knowledge mm -hmm. at all in terms of their worldview. And maybe he's just picking up the common phraseology, but it doesn't seem like, I mean, it seems like the earlier statement he made is true, that you can demonstrate inconsistencies and moral compromises. But, I mean, to say that they can't account for knowledge, I mean, what is that? You're saying that might be a little bit harder to prove? 
just don't think that he's proven it. I think he's borrowing the terminology, but I don't think that just because you show contradiction and compromise doesn't necessarily mean you can't compromise at all. Or if it lacks that redemptive story or tell everything the Bible tells, they can just say, well, our religion doesn't deal with that. Yeah. It's like Christianity doesn't answer. Yeah, and that's probably what they would say. So I think for someone to make that claim like that, he would have to work pretty hard. But I see, I see you're saying that. In other words, it may sound good, but as far as how that might practically work out, it, that probably wouldn't be that effective without going deeper. Yeah, yeah I thought of that too. It's good to show that their need for redemption, yeah. that their religion doesn't answer that. But when you make statements like that to people, yeah. if you can't back it up, it seems like it would really just turn them off. Right. They could say that about you. Well, your religion doesn't deal with this. Right. Yeah. Right. I would say... I, you know, I, I think looking at these as far as the fact that there could be three, th you know, there appears to be three different emphases. Again, I don't see these as being mutually exclusive. I would say that I, I think that he brings up a good point, which is the whole idea of the, of the proactive presentation of the Christian worldview. Um, I would say that as I I've, as I've practi practically have dealt with people you know, even Muslims on this issue, I find myself doing that. I mean, I, I mean, I, I feel a little. I, I guess if you're just thinking about practically, I think it's, I think it's fairly intimidating to the average Christian to say that they know the Quran well enough to deal with a Muslim to show them internal contradictions. I think that can be done. I think that could be done. I think if you have the time to do that, <laughs> that would be helpful. But I, but as far as being a helpful practical strategy, I think the third. And I'm just giving my opinion here. I think, uh, without saying that the third approach is mutually exclusive to the other two, and maybe it's good to incorporate incorporate elements of the others, I find probably that being the probably being the most practical and best, and it certainly would be a biblical approach. And I think again, I think you could tie it to uh, Acts 17 with the full orb Christian worldview from creation to judgment uh, that's done on uh, Mars Hill in Athens with the Apostle Paul. I would say that I find myself incorporating a lot of that point three in my uh, world religions class. Uh, you know, I've shown you a little bit here with uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam or whatever, but the, uh, you know, talking about the ten, the 10 major points of a worldview and then showing the Christian contrast. So I, I like that idea. I, I like that. Um, I personally believe that as you're sharing truth that you are contrasting with false beliefs. I mean, as you present truth and somebody else holds a different view, there is a contrast. Perhaps it can be more explicit or implicit based on how much you know about what they're believing. But I think when Paul was presenting the creator God, the sustaining God, the personal caring God, the judging God in Acts 17, that was contrasting with the false views of the, of the people that he was preaching to at this time. So... I, I, I like that. Like I said, I'm not saying that's mutually exclusive, but that's a very positive presentation of the gospel. I think it shows depth uh, as you explain who God is, who humans are, what the problem is, where history is going, what God's solution is, uh, eschatology as far as the restoration of all things. Um, I think that's a very uh, uh, rich uh, uh, biblical way of going about things. So I also like what you know, Dan and Massimo were talking about as far as the, uh, you know, picking up where they're at, uh, point of contrast, uh, you know, making those things. So um, I'm just saying personally, I, I think I, 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 do, uh, I do resonate with, with what he's saying there as far as the point three. I think, I think we need to understand our Christian worldview strongly and depthly rooted in scripture, you know, and taking that to the unbeliever, whatever their uh, worldview is. So I don't, I've always been a little bit uncomfortable with just the primary argument being the impossibility of the contrary. I don't know why, if it has to be as stark as that without a positive presentation. Okay, let's go ahead and look at the Bonson uh, article. This was what done in uh, 1996. Presuppositional reasoning with false faiths by Dr. Greg Bonson. Presuppositional apologetics is taught by Van Til argues or urges the Christian to argue with unbelievers in an indirect fashion, doing an internal analysis of the unbeliever's worldview, his fundamental assumptions about reality, knowledge, and ethics, and comparing it to the worldview revealed in the Bible. Many students of apologetics have come to see the strength of this apologetical challenge when it is applied to various kinds of views advocated by atheist or materialist. 
Given the presuppositions of the atheist, he cannot make sense out of adherence to the laws of logic, as I showed in the debate with Stein, nor can he make sense of the principles of procedures of science itself, as he did with his debate with Tabash. The atheist cannot give a rational account of the fundamental assumptions of ethics either. Atheism is philosophically unable to argue ethically, scientifically, or logically against the Christian faith. The question sometimes arises whether the presuppositional method can argue as effectively against non-atheist, however. <clears throat> that is, students of apologetics wonder whether we can argue presuppositionally with unbelievers who adhere to false religious faiths. They might not seem to fall so readily into the philosophical problems of unbelievers who deny any supernatural reality whatsoever. So how does a presuppositional apologist deal with someone who has another god or another religious book? It is imperative that we bear in mind that Van Til describes the presuppositional method from the outset setting forth and working with the distinctive doctrines of Christian theism. Van Til's presuppositional method is concrete, not abstract or formal. He does not enter into debate with the unbeliever merely uh, the worldview of generic God of some undetermined nature and character, but the specific and full worldview of biblical Christianity. That is why Van Til's apologetic syllabus and the book, The Defense of the Faith, both began with detailed statements of Christian theology. These were not simply a review warming up to apologetics. They were for Van Til a defining part of the apologetical task. Accordingly, the presuppositional method is not at all amenable to use by just any other religion which competes with Christianity, as many critics have hastily suggested. How does the apologist deal with advocates of other religious faiths? if he wishes to use the presuppositional method, the same way he deals with atheist and materialist, etc., by the apologist internally examines the worldview which is offered by whatever religious devotee is having the dialogue uh, with him. So in other words, you, you have to do an internal critique, just like you would do with atheism. The formal fact that the opposing religionist speaks of God or gods is not a difficulty here. For they must define their specific concept of deity. Remember here the example of scripture. For their rock is not as our rock. Deuteronomy 32, 31. I like that. I have to look at it in its context. But that. Uh, recall the devastating prophetic critique of the heathens' lifeless idols, which are contradictory uh, under the sovereignty of those who bow down to them. The use of religious vocabulary and appeals does not change the applicability of the indirect method of disproving uh, your opponent's presuppositions. Most unstudied comments by people about comparative religion, for instance, that all religions are alike, or you can have your pick of sacred books, can easily be contradicted by the apologist. If anybody is tempted to be the spokesman and defender of just any non-Christian religion, so as to silence the Christian apologetic, it must be politely observed that the overwhelming and vast majority of world religions cannot even offer epistemological competition to the Christian worldview. They have no basis for knowing what they claim at all. Why? There are indeed other sacred books, but they are nothing at all like what the Bible presents itself as being. What does an internal analysis of the metaphysical and epistemological presuppositions of these different religions uncover? Metaphysically, there is no God or no personal God or no God who is omniscient and sovereign, etc. Accordingly, from an epistemological perspective, these sacred books are not and cannot be anything like what the Bible claims for itself, namely to be the personal communication and infallible verbal revelation from the only living, completely sovereign and all-knowing creator. The other religious books on their own presuppositions give no reason to submit to them as true or normative. In terms of their own worldviews, these books as pieces of literature can have no epistemological or ethical authority. What they say, when you can make sense of them at all, cannot be anything but simply one man's opinion against another man's opinion. The remaining world religions or cults which might begin to have something to offer in competition with Christianity uh, are usually poor imitations of a quasi-Christian philosophical outlook, or they can be treated as Christian heresies, borrowing or deferring to portions of the Bible itself or misreadings of it. Ordinarily, the best tactic is to reason with such religious competitors from Scripture itself, then refuting the departures and misinterpretations from what has been acknowledged as the Word of God. Now, on that point there, I mean, that almost sounds a little bit like the point three, 
or no, well, he, well, first of all, he says ordinarily the best tack is to reason with such religious comp- competitors from Scripture, then refute uh, the departures and misinterpretations from what has been acknowledged as the Word of God. This too amounts to an internal critique of the worldview. Now that statement there almost sounds like an affirmation of point three, which is positive proclamation of truth, then internal critique. So that, that's good. Uh, for example, parts of Sung uh, Myung Moon's teachings cannot be authorized by him simply with an appeal to the Bible when, when he in fact rejects other parts of the Bible. Let's go to the next page. Uh, in some people's mind, it is the Muslim faith, however, which presents a threat to presuppositional apologetics because it is imagined Islam can counterfeit or counter each move in the Christian's argument. This, too, is an inaccurate preconception. The two worldviews are dissimilar in pivotal ways when one reflects on Islam's Unitarianism, fatalism, moral concepts, lack of redemption, etc. Islam can be internally critiqued on its own presuppositions. Take an obvious example. The Quran acknowledges that the words of Moses, David, and Jesus to be the words of the prophets sent by Allah, in which case the Quran may be on its own terms refuted because of its contradiction with earlier revelation, which I think is a valid point. Uh, sophisticated theologies offered by Muslim scholars interpret the theology of the Quran as teaching the transcendence of unchanging Allah in such an extreme fashion that no human language derived from changing experience can positively and appropriately describe Allah, in which case the Quran rules out what the Quran claims to be. Then again, the Islamic worldview teaches that God is holy and just towards sin, but unlike the theology of the Bible, see here the words of Moses, David, and Jesus, there can indeed be salvation where guilt remains unremitted by the shedding of blood of a substitute for the sinner. The legalism of Islam does not address this problem because a a person's previous bad works are not changed by later good ones, but continues in one's record in the very site, uh, Allah. Thus we see that Van Til's presuppositional approach to defending the faith is an effective tool for responding to all kinds of unbelievers, irreligious and religious alike. That is because all men think in the context of a broader worldview which can be internally criticized even if it utilizes religious concepts. Uh, The only religious concepts which can make philosophical sense out of life are those definite concrete truths revealed infallibly by God in his own word. What do you think of that article? So he does talk about their positive presentation of truth, um, you know, followed by internal critique. Again, it appears to hit hard the whole concept that uh, Islam does not appear to have a, uh, an answer for uh, sin. So what do you think when it comes to you know, those three points? You know, in other words, we talked about the three approaches that you could take as, which appear to be acceptable to presuppositionalists. In, internal critique of Islam, uh, emphasizing perversions of Islam, in comparison with Christianity, and then a uh, straight-out worldview comparison. Um, appears to me that those aren't mutually exclusive. I mean, it, it seems to me that those would be things that, uh, you know, would perhaps could tie together. Again, doing the internal critique of Islam is probably not going to be something your average Christian is going to be able to do. Um, but certainly wouldn't be wrong to do it either. So, any thoughts on that? Yes, Jared. Um, this is maybe semi-related, and I think Boston addresses it a little bit, but I remember Frank said that um, that the triune God best explains um, you know, us as humans, you know, having In relationship Islam. and all that, yeah. yeah. Um, and that, you know, Islam, because, you know, you know Allah being this you know, yeah. experience concept, do you think that that argument, maybe that's not a slam dunk, but do you think that holds? Yeah, I do. I think it holds water. I'm, and I, that probably would fit under number three, where you're presenting... The, the full orb Christian worldview, and that would certainly fit under uh, the absolute who God is, you know, and, and bringing that up, I think that would be totally legitimate. Yep. I just remember when we talked about the contradictions with the earlier revelation, how the Islamic gentleman actually responded to uh, some of those comments when he said that men changed the words of Jesus, mm-hmm. and I think he kind of pointed to some type of criticism, I don't know if we're talking about the historical Jesus, the right. seminars or whatever, but yeah. made a side reference to, that's kind of already been dealt with and proven, right. you know, that Jesus didn't say everything that's in the Bible anyway, right. passing 
that was his passing, I think, solution for that. Right. Like, almost cut it off in the past. That yeah, sure, it's some contradiction. It's, it's man's work. Yeah, he did make. In other words, he, he he appeals to some of the perhaps the literal criticisms of uh, the the transmission process and all that sort of thing, right? He, yeah, he did do that. Which, if I hopefully I'm not reading into what Bonson would say, but in listening to some of his tapes or whatever, I think he would put that under the category of a baseless speculation, and would actually come back with him with, you know, you said that, but what's your proof for that? I mean, it's one thing to say it in general, but it's another to actually. But yeah, you're you're right. He did bring that up. Okay, let's look at um, the concluding notes that we have here, which would be um, starting on page 143. Uh, some of you know Tom Christie. He took the major religions class and did a nice uh, critique of Islam. And I, um, uh, a lot of what I've included in here it came from his paper on uh, confronting Islam with the Christian worldview. <clears throat> Some of you have had me for the world religions class. A lot of you haven't. Uh, one of the things that we do in the class is, I mean, you've gotten a little bit of a slice here of what we do where we believe that every religion and worldview can be put through a grid of answering about 10 different issues. Who the absolute is, what the world is, who humans are, what the problem is, what the solution is, view of history, those kinds of things. And so one of the things that we did in the class is we would, uh, you know, compare and contrast and actually did a lot of, of point number three, what we were talking about as far as the positive presentation of Christian worldview to show the contrast. So uh, Tom did some of that. I mentioned some of the things that he mentions here. Um, as far as the absolute goes, on page 143, both the Christian and the Islamic worldviews affirm that there is only one true God and that all other gods are false. Islam believes that Allah does not exist in the Trinity, while Christianity teaches that God exists in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Christian will find the Muslim to be strongly monotheistic, but will radically oppose the doctrine of the Trinity. And we'll probably call you a polytheist. Uh, the world, uh, Allah created the world from nothing and is completely dependent upon him, yet has a separate existence. The world consists of three parts, hell, earth, and heaven. The Islamic view of the world appears to be inherited from Christianity and Judaism, the world is the creation of God, exists for him, and is controlled by him. The Christian will find the Muslim to be in stronger agreement about the sovereignty of God over creation. Humans, humans are created beings. Uh, humans have been given free will and are responsible for the manner in which they live. Christianity affirms that mankind has been plunged into sin through Adam's disobedience. Islam disagrees, believing that humans are not born fallen, but only sin through personal choice. Uh, both agree that men are created for God and are responsible to him for the manner in which they live. So you don't see the uh, imputation aspect there with Islam. Problem for humans, disobedience to the teachings of God has alienated man from God. Man will be judged for his actions at a coming day. Similar to Christianity, Islam teaches that God has set divine standards to which man will be held responsible. Within Islam, there is recognition of sin and the coming judgment of God. The Christians should focus upon this element, seeking to demonstrate the superiority of the solution for sin found in Christianity. The solution for humans, belief in one God, acceptance of the prophet Muhammad, and submission to his teachings will lead to eternal reward. Rejection of the prophet will lead to damnation. Islam teaches that one will be rewarded if their good deeds exceed their bad deeds. In contrast, Christianity teaches that salvation is a gift of God through faith by grace. I would even make clear, too, that it w I would even specify that more. Is there, there is no, I mean, e even if you do a 99 to 1 with good deeds, unless you die as a martyr, there is no assurance that you'll end up in, in heaven. So um, it's even more than that. Uh, the Christian must seek to make clear the contrast between the uncertainty and difficulty of salvation by works and the comfort and joy of salvation by grace. The free gift of salvation available in Jesus Christ should be the centerpiece of any interaction with Muslims. Community and ethics, Islam is a major, I'm sorry, is a public uh, religion that promotes an Islamic uh, society. You know, Christianity emphasizes the church. Interpretation of history, Islam is the only true religion, according to Islam, and was taught by Allah to the prophets, including Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. This world is heading towards a day of judgment when the righteous will be separated from the unrighteous. Christianity affirms that the Old Testament prophets were true and faithful, 
but sees Christ as the culmination of revelation and the center point of history. Christianity affirms that the world is heading towards a day of judgment and the Christian should take advantage of the Muslim's awareness of coming judgment to bring them to deal with the questions of sin and what makes one acceptable to God. As far as time goes, Islam believes in a linear progression of time. This world will culminate with a great day of judgment after which will come the eternal state. Christianity affirms this understanding of time. The Christian should take advantage of the Muslim's awareness that this is the only life they have. The Christian should draw the Muslim to consider the priority of their eternal soul and can use the Islamic view of time to bring them along. Life after death. Each person has one life for which they will be responsible for their actions. Islam does not teach any form of reincarnation and the dead await the coming day of judgment when they will be resurrected either to eternal life or eternal torment. The Islamic and Christian view of life after death is essentially synonymous. The Christian should encourage the Muslim to think about the afterlife and can presume an understanding that eternity will be split into a heaven and a hell. As far as relationship to other religions, Islam is fundamentally against all polytheistic religions. In Islamic countries, polytheists were forced to convert or die. This Islam is aggressively opposed to Hinduism, Buddhism, and native tribal religions. Monotheists with the sacred scripture, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians are tolerated but will still be judged for rejecting Muhammad. The Christian must be aware that Islam calls for the death of any who leave the religion. For the Muslim, there are serious consequences to considering other religions. The Christian must be aware that the call to repentance may cause the Muslim to be forsaken by his community and should be prepared to encourage and support one if he should turn to Christ. As far as practical strategies for sharing with Muslims, uh, one of the things that you can do is recognize key stumbling stones. For, Muslim, uh, for a Muslim, certain elements of Christianity are particularly controversial, and the Christian must be well prepared to discuss these topics. The Christian must be able to discuss and defend the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, to the Muslim, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity is extremely offensive and constitutes shirk, the unforgivable sin of worshiping another alongside Allah. Thus, the Christian must be prepared for a Muslim to have major problems with the doctrine of the Trinity. The Christian must make sure to explain how Christ is not literally the Son via sexual intercourse, but rather a Son in terms of a perfect reflection of the Father. Christ is the Son not in terms of physical generation, but special relationship to the Father. Second, the Christian must explain that the Trinity does not affirm tritheism. There is only one God. Christianity is monotheistic, but holds that there are three persons in the unity of the one essence. You must also talk about the deity of Christ. Islam teaches that Christ was not divine, but rather he was only a prophet of Allah. The Christian must be prepared to defend the deity of Christ. Due to Muslim difficulties with the term son of God, they often see it as implying a physical son born of sexual intercourse between Allah and the Virgin Mary, which is a totally abhorrent idea to Muslim sensibilities. The Christian should focus on Christ's self-identification with Yahweh. Passages you know, would include various ones that are mentioned there. Number three, the term Son of God. For many Muslims, the term Son of God as ascribed to Jesus implies a grossly materialistic view of God. They see the term as implying that God by sexual intercourse brought forth a son. The Christian must clarify that Christ is not the physical Son of God, but the Son in the sense that he is unique in relation to God. In Arabic, there are two words for son. Walad, which implies a physical generation, and abin, which is used in a broader sense. The Christian must clarify that Christ is the abin of God and not the wallet of God. Nature of revelation. For the Muslim, revelation is seen as the verbal dictation of a heavenly message. Muhammad did not write the Quran, but rather it was dictated to him. Islam believes that what Muhammad was told was recitations of a heavenly Quran. Islam teaches a revelation which is already written on a heavenly prototype. The Quran is a perfect replica of the eternal word in heaven. It is particularly significant that the Christian explain that biblical revelation is not conceived of as divine dictation. The authors left their personality and background upon the content of their work, yet what they wrote is still God's word to men. Biblical revelation is not dictation, nor is it tainted. Reliability of scripture. Islam teaches that Jesus was a prophet of Allah and, a true, and taught a true gospel which agrees with Islam. The Quran teaches its readers to confirm the truthfulness of its messages by comparing it to the contents of the previous divine revelation to Jews and Christians. But Islam also teaches that this revelation has been corrupted since Muhammad's day. 
They call this doctrine tarif. According to this doctrine, the biblical texts have been corrupted and teach false doctrine. The Christian must be prepared to respond to this claim. The doctrine of tarif is founded as is unfounded as complete biblical manuscripts exist from over 200 years before Muhammad, and these manuscripts are in complete agreement with the modern text. Six, the distinction between Christianity and Western society. This is an important one here. Uh, many Muslims do not distinguish between Christianity and Western society. It is common for Muslims to confuse a call to accept the gospel as a call to become a Westerner. Many Muslims see Christianity as corrupt and immoral because of the tremendous wickedness prevalent in Western culture. The Christian must make sure to make a clear distinction between the Christian gospel and Western society. Last point here, keep the focus on the essentials. In approaching a Muslim with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Christian must remember that all people have the same need, the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God. To convince a Muslim of the integrity of scripture or the reasonableness of the doctrine of the Trinity does not bring them to salvation. The Muslim must eventually be challenged to place their trust in Christ, the incarnate deity and Messiah, as the atoning sacrifice who died to pay the penalty for their sin and rose from the grave so that they might be reconciled to God. The Christian is called to faithfully proclaim the gospel to all nations and speaking to Muslims, the Christian must take care to carefully explain the gospel, highlighting the specific areas defined in this paper to reduce confusion and bring clarity in the presentation of the truth calling the sinner to repentance and trust in Christ. By God's grace in doing so, the believer will be found faithful to his or her duty. Okay, so just a little bit of compare and contrast there and some tips. Okay, any other thoughts about Islam? Yeah, John. Um, I was curious um, about the statement here in, that uh, uh, the, under the world, in the world mm -hmm. view of the beef, that um, the Christian will find the Muslim to be in strong agreement about the sovereignty of God. Mm -hmm. um, I, t tell me, you know, you probably, uh, you know, I know you know more about this, but but uh, as far as the the sovereignty of God goes, I remember looking into it and finding that God, it in the Muslim definition, is pure will, is mm -hmm. is the current, you know, the current thinking, which means that he doesn't make. He doesn't make choices in his will out of his character, mm -hmm. but that he is absolute will and as such subject to change at any point. Mm -hmm. And that that, that that foundation of the sovereignty of God would be drastically different. But tell me, you know, uh, maybe there's something. So how would you see it? Like, uh, what would be your understanding as far as, uh, like, the contrast? The contrast like, yeah. would be that, that God's sovereignty is not tied to his faithfulness. God's sovereignty is not tied to... No, so in other words, within the concept of Islam, that he, there can, there's an arbitrariness? Yes. Yeah. And I think that I, that is my understanding. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, and, and that's why that helps attribute to even less security for the Muslim. Because, I mean, it, technically, I mean, a, a, w with that concept, a Muslim really, in a sense, can do everything perfectly and still not make it. Because God has a bad day and just... Right. No. Yeah. So clearly, if you, yeah, I mean, if you... I think on this concept of the thing that's being emphasized here is, is, is an incredible strong sovereignty. As a matter of fact, some people would even view Islam as being fatalistic in the sense that it's so strong in that regard. So I think the point that he was making there is, you know, transcendent personal God or transcendent God, sovereign control. But that point you're bringing up is true. I mean, there is a sense in which there's an arbitrariness. There's a sense in which, yeah, like you pointed that God can almost in a sense act in an arbitrary way which is inconsistent with the Christian concept. So that's my understanding. Okay, yep. Can Jeff. You how the Muslim scholars deal with the Tari? Meaning if, if, if you show a Muslim scholar that there's Old Testament scripture prior to the time of Muhammad and contradicts Quran, what do mm -hmm. you do with that? Yeah, what page are you on again? I'm sorry, um, the point five, 146. Uh, let's see here. So we're talking about um, teaches they call this doctrine decree. According to this doctrine, the biblical texts have been corrupted and teach false doctrine. The Christian must be prepared to respond to this claim. Can I say it again? Uh, have they responded to what now? By, by reading this, just this limited statement alone, it yeah. seems like any Old Testament scripture prior to the time of Muhammad, if you could have dated, it has not been corrupted. Yeah. It's only been corrupted from the time of Muhammad on. So if the Quran contradicts Old Testament scripture that is older than the time mm -hmm. of Muhammad, what do they do with that? Do well, they're... No, I think they would say that it's it's been it's been corrupted earlier. Oh, 
okay. would be their view. Okay, I'm sorry. That, yeah, let me see the wording there. Um, this is a multi the revelation has been encrypted since Muhammad's day. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, that probably should be reworded. Yeah, because yeah, in other words, yeah, it. Um, yeah, I think I think that they would say that there's corruption going on before. Because I mean, they would even claim with the New Testament that there's truths, but that the uh, the followers of Jesus corrupted that. So that thanks for catching that. I think that's a that needs to be rewarded. Good. Okay. Any other thoughts on Islam? Yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. Um, I have heard um, that Allah was actually at one point a moon god amongst the whole, you know, a whole you know, group of other gods, and that you know he was kind of singled out and you know exalted as the only god. Is that true? Is that progression be seen? In other words, uh, within a polyethe- polytheistic system. Yeah. I haven't heard that. Yeah, that may be part of some tradition or whatever, but I don't think that's normative. Yep, Richard. Can you please clarify the correction that y'all just made? Um, the correction in point five would be is that Islam does claim that some of the, 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 the uh, corruptions in the Bible, it's not correct to say that the, all the corruptions have taken place since Muhammad's day. Um, they would believe that some corruptions have taken place, you know, before Muhammad came. So in other words, it wouldn't be correct to say... Um, they, it's not correct to say that the, like the New Testament has been corrupted after Muhammad. They would say that the, the, the followers of Jesus were immediately involved with corrupting his sayings. So we argument that he had down there. The manuscript existed for over 200 years before Muhammad. Did this prove that? Let me see here. The Christian must prove So the, the doctrine, he's, so Tom's saying, the doctrine is found as complete biblical manuscripts exist from over 200 years before Muhammad, and these manuscripts are in co- complete agreement with, should probably be modern, not modem, since they didn't have the computers there. Um, so the doctrine is unfounded as complete biblical manuscripts exist from over 200 years before Muhammad. So are you seeing a contradiction there with that then? or I, and I mean, in other words, that you would have, I'll have to I, yeah, well, I'd have to look into that. I to to look at the wording of that again. I'm sorry. Yeah. What he's saying that appears to contradict what y'all just said. He's backing that up. He's backing up his okay. argument that he's he's saying that that is the Muslims' interpretation of scripture that it was mm-hmm. later corrupted, and he's using that argument and saying that there's complete manuscripts from before Muhammad's birth. And what you're saying and what the other guy suggests are y'all saying that. Muslims don't actually believe that, that they would go back further and say they've always been that the Jews corrupted the scriptures long before yeah. that. I know that they believe that there was corruption that took place before Muhammad. So this guy's argument well, I, I, yeah, I'll have to relook at that. I or maybe I'm just reading him wrong. I'll have to I'll have to look into that. So Yep. I've heard some people make that argument saying because Muhammad says read the Old scriptures that at that point Muhammad was saying that they were valid or not corrupted and therefore corruption must have come afterwards. Mm-hmm. And then you can use that argument to say, mm-hmm. well, no, there's not evidence of corruption afterwards. Muslims that I've talked to, they, they will push it back and say even before Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, it was all earlier. And they so they would push back that way. In what sense? They would say the corruption is much earlier, yeah. so it doesn't matter if there's manuscripts from 200 BC. Right. You know, it, it must have happened before yeah. then. So maybe this is a case where you find different ones make a different, because my understanding is that they believe the corruption too happened earlier. So, all right, I'll, for next class, I'll check into that, make sure that lines up. Okay. I was gonna say the whole basis for uh, Muhammad mm-hmm. having to be the final prophet is that all the previous revelation had been corrupted. been corrupted, right. So even when they talk about Yeah, that's Muhammad, a good point. Because he's calibrating what's been messed up. So you had these other prophets come on the scene and say good things, but the followers tampered with it, and so he calibrates. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. What, uh, do, do you see a lot of apologetic strength in bringing up abrogation? Abrogation? Mm-hmm. What do you mean? What's the, the cancellation of certain Muslim scriptures mm-hmm. by other ones, because you know they'll deal with contradictions in the Quran by saying, well, this one abrogates the other, and, mm-hmm. and they have you know the schools have thought about which yeah. you know which scriptures supersede others. Yeah, yeah, I think there's some validity to that. 
I mean, I'm going to be honest, I'm not a, a big expert on how all that has worked together and the specific examples or whatever, but I think there's some validity to that.